Well, we have now had a look at the cost function with the, the well, what we call the relevant cost for uh, determining the optimal inventory, uh, optimal inventory policy. Uh, and we uh, know that this G function, the cost function, is uh, dependent on the variable Q, the order size. It will include the purchase cost, the ordering cost, and the holding cost. Three parts of the cost function. And we have also had a very short uh, repetition from mathematics. Know that uh, to find the optimal point of a function, we should try to derive it and then set the derived function equal to zero because then you will have the either the maximum or the minimum point uh, when you solve the function, uh, the derived function equal to, to zero. So let's now try to derive this cost function. <coughs> and we can first look at uh, the purchase cost. How can we derive it? We know that the variable is the Q, so derive the G function with respect to Q. Well, the purchase cost is not actually dependent on Q. It will be the same, it's a constant, uh, as long as the unit cost is the same independent of the order size, this will be treated as a constant and deriving a constant, then it will be zero. This part will not depend on the order size unless you have a situation with discounts where the price will be lower when you are ordering uh, more uh, or more than a, a certain breakpoint. We will come back to discount models in later, uh, maybe today or at least next uh, Wednesday. But so far, the purchase cost is considered as a constant and deriving constant, you will have zero left. So this is actually not relevant when determining the optimal order size in this very uh, the, this simple example. But the ordering cost, however, here we have a Q. We have a Q in the denominator, and we need to derive this part with respect to Q. Since Q is in the denominator, we will have a negative minus. We will have lambda multiplied by K is the denominator, and divided by Q to the power of 2. This will be the derived uh, function or, or the derived of, of this uh, factor here regarding the ordering cost. Minus lambda, the demand, multiplied by k, the ordering cost, divided by the order size to the power of 2. And at last, deriving the holding cost. Well, here we have the q, the variable, to the power of 1. Deriving that part, you are left with 1, and you have h divided by 2. So this is now the expression for the derived function for the cost function shown here. The derived g function minus lambda k divided by the square of q plus h divided by 2. Put this function equal to 0. Identify the optimal point, in this case the minimum point, since we, are want, we want to minimize the costs. And then we can see that this part, the negative part, plus this positive part should be zero, which means that h divided by 2 should be equal to lambda k divided by q to the power of 2. This part and this part should be the same. And solve this with respect to q. We can find that cross multiply q to the power of 2 multiplied by h should be equal to 2 multiplied by lambda <coughs> k, which again means that you can derive by h and take the square root to find the expression for the single q. So 
we will find that Q, and we can mark that with a star as the Q optimal, is equal to the square root of 2 lambda k divided by h. This is denoted as the EOQ function, the economic order quantity. <coughs> to find the optimal order size in a simple um, situation like we have described here with the assumptions shown in an earlier slide, you will find the optimal value or the optimal size of the order by take the square root of 2 multiplied by the demand, the annual demand, multiplied by the one-time ordering cost, and divide by h, which is the holding cost per unit, per unit time. What is very important is that you have the same unit time here, so if you have the annual demand, you need to divide by the holding cost per year. If the demand is given per month, you need to calculate and find the holding cost per month, and so on. The time unit needs to be the same. And this is a well, quite common mistake in problems, in assignments and exams, for example. You might be given the demand per month and the holding cost per year. And then you need to calculate to be consistent here. So this is very important to, to be aware of. Uh, this is, uh, as mentioned, called the EOQ formula, uh, also often denoted as the Q star, the optimal Q. Uh, it can be uh, also be named as the Wilson's formula, which is uh, named after a guy called Wilson, who was the first one who at least started to use this uh, formula extensively. Uh, it was uh, proved quite early in the 1900, 1913, I think by a guy called Harris and this Wilson guy, who actually has got the, the, the formula named after him, started in the 1930s to, to use it extensively. So, this is the formula which can be used to try to determine the optimal order size in this very simple, simplified situation where you have a deterministic or fixed rate demand. And we can also see some properties here. This is the formula. And then Q is increasing with both K and lambda and decreasing with H. It's quite easy to see here. If the ordering cost is increasing, then the order size should also increase. Quite logical. If it's more costly to place one order, you should order more every time so you don't have to order so frequently. And similar, if the demand is increasing, you should also increase the order size. With a higher demand, you should order more items each time you're placing an order. And similar, if the H is increasing, if it's more costly to store one item, then you should probably have a lower order size. Don't order so much, because then it will be cheaper to, to store inventory. Uh, and also, it changes with the square root of the quantity, so it's not linear. Uh, but you need to, to take the square root to find the optimal size. So you need to recalculate if any of the parameter values are changing. And Q is independent of the proportional order co cost. C, which we saw here when we tried to, uh, when we derived the formula, because this purchase cost is also uh, will be a constant and it will be independent of the order size. Even if we saw that the cost of one order will uh, uh, consist of the k value, the fixed cost of placing an order, and a variable uh, part, which is the uh, cost per item. In total, the purchase cost will be a constant as long as this C does not uh, vary with respect to the order size. If you pay exactly the same per item, independent of the, uh, of the order size, this will be a constant. 
and then it doesn't affect the optimal order size. <coughs> now we can look at this cost curve. Because uh, as we just talked about, this purchase cost can be a constant, and then you don't have to show them. It will be, well, it will be a constant, and it might raise the graphs, but uh, it doesn't affect the graphs there. So here we can only look at the two parts of the G function, which now is considered as relevant, the ordering cost and the holding cost. And first looking at the ordering cost, the graph of the ordering cost is what you can see here. It means that when Q increases, then the ordering cost will decrease. If you are ordering many items at a time, you don't have to order that frequently, and the Q uh, and, and the ordering cost will be lower. With a low value, you are ordering few items every time, then the ordering cost will be pretty high. And similar, the second part of the cost function, it's uh, this line, which is linear, the holding cost, one half of Q multiplied by H. And this will, of course, be higher when you are ordering more items. Then you need to store more items. And with a small Q, you will not have very much um, uh, in hauling cost. But with a large Q, you will have a high order cost. And what is quite interesting here is what you see, that on this point, with this particular value of Q, which is the Q star, the optimal one, the two cost factors are exactly the same. This line, the upper line here, is the sum of the two uh, cost factors, which is considered relevant, the ordering cost and the holding cost. Uh, and at this point, the minimum point, these two cost factors are exactly the same. If Q is higher, then the holding cost will be the major part of the total cost. And if Q is lower, then the ordering cost will be the major part. But at this point, they are exactly at the same level. <coughs> so let's now try to look at one particular example on this. We have seen the formula. And let's try to solve a problem. I will go through a problem from the textbook. I also have some examples on solutions on, the, uh, on some of the, the problems given after the chapters in the textbook. I will upload a few of them in, uh, in front of after the, the lecture, even if I will probably not have time to go through all the examples on the blackboard. But of course, you should try to study them and try to understand them. And if you have problem understanding, of course, co you can send me an email or, or ask me, and I will try to, to explain them better. So let's now try to look at one numerical example to show how this can be used to determine the optimal order size. And let's now assume we will look at example 4.1 in the textbook, page 212. We'll go through the different steps and try to explain what we are doing. So let's first try to identify the values of the parameters. And we are given this problem, which is uh, pencils. Show, uh, uh, pencils, which, which is uh, sold at a rate of 60 per week. So now we are given a demand per week. And since we know that one year will consist of 52 weeks in normal, then we can easily calculate the annual demand. So the demand in this example, the lambda value, will be 60 per week, 60 per week multiplied by 52 weeks which is a total of 3,120. 
this is now the annual demand. And the reason I am calculating the annual demand, even if it was given as 60 per week, given as a weekly demand, is that we need to make sure that this parameter, the demand, and this parameter, the hauling cost, will be of this, uh, will use the same time unit. Uh, because the hauling cost is also given, and here we are given the interest rate first, and the interest rate is given to be 25% per year. And the C value, the value of one pencil, is given to be, well, not much, but 0 0.02 dollars, two cents. Like this. So it's not much in money, but anyway, we can use this example to try to, to explain this theory. So since one item has a value of two uh, cents or 0 0.02 dollars, we can find the holding cost as C multiplied by I, which is 0 0.02 uh, and multiplied by 25%, which is 0 0.005. So to store one pencil for one year, it will cost you half a cent. Not very much, but anyway, this is the cost, the holding cost in this example. What we are also given in information in this uh, problem is the sales price. Sales price is often denoted as the small p, which is 15 cents, 0 0.15. But in this case, we are talking about a minimization problem. We want to minimize the cost. So this is actually not relevant. We can easily find a profit for the optimal policy. We have the annual demand, and you know that this is a fixed rate demand, 60 per week or 3,120 per year. We can find the profit by multiplying the sales price with the demand and subtract the cost uh, regarding the, the, the relevant cost for, from this, but the optimal policy will still be the same because you, when you have a fixed income, then of course the profit will be dependent on, uh, on, the, uh, on the cost function. So here we are looking at minimizing the cost function and then this information is actually irrelevant. It doesn't really matter because we will have a fixed income and we will want to minimize the cost to make the maximum of profit. Uh, we are also given information about K. So here the K ordering cost, place one order is given to be $12. Uh, and then we have the demand, we have the ordering cost, we have the holding cost, and we can use this information to calculate the optimal Q by using this formula here. So the optimal Q, the Q star, EOQ value, will now be the square root of 2 multiplied by K, which is 12, and multiply by the annual demand, which is 3,120. Divided by the holding cost of 0 0.005. Or we could use the weekly demand of 60, but then we also need to find the weekly holding cost, which might be well, will be 0 0.005 divided by 52. So it's very important to use the same time unit on the demand and on the holding cost. 
Uh, and then, of course, it wouldn't matter what time unit you use because the result will be the same, but you need to, to be consistent and use the same time unit. This will give us an optimal order size, which is 3870. Try to calculate this and you will find the value 3870. And this tells us that the optimal order size in this case, order 3870 pencils each time you place an order. In this case, the order size is actually larger than the annual demand. So you should order pencils, well, less frequent than one year. <coughs> uh, so we can then find the cycle time. And the cycle time will be the Q, the order size, divided by the demand, which now is 3,870 divided by 3,120, which is 1.24. This is the cycle time. This is how long it should go between you place one order and until you place the next order. 1.24 years. <coughs> and let's now try to look at the two relevant cost functions, as we remember the purchase cost will be a constant. It will be the demand, 3,120, multiplied by C, 0 0.02, which is a constant and not really uh, relevant when we are finding or talking about the optimal order size. But the two other cost uh, parts of the cost function is relevant. And let's now first look at the holding cost. And the holding cost will be one half multiplied by Q multiplied by H, which is one half multiplied by 3870 multiplied by this value, 0 0.005, uh, which is 9.67. And the ordering cost will be the demand divided by Q and multiplied by K, which is 3120 divided by 3870. And we can see that this is less than one. Still, we are talking about the annual cost, so even if you don't order every year, this will be some kind of average cost per year if you are looking far into the future. So we need to have a fixed time unit to compare costs of different policies. So we will here use, which is most common, use the annual cost. So this will be 3,120 divided by the order size of 3870 and multiplied by k equal to 12 and we'll also get the total the result here for the order cost of 9.67 per year so we have now seen that this is the situation we have calculated the optimal order size and we have seen that the cost is exactly the same for the two relevant cost functions the holding cost and the order cost in this case the costs are exactly the same for the optimal policy which will give the minimum total cost uh, so this is now the optimal Q which is found to be 3870 uh, <coughs> we can also talk about what we call the sensitivity. Uh, and here we can see that this is the, well, the, the G function uh, excluded the purchase cost, which is not considered relevant so far, uh, so far 
for, th for this example. So now we have the cost function with the relevant cost here. This is the expression for the ordering cost. And this is the expression for the holding cost. So we have these two cost elements. This formula tells us something about the sensitivity of this formula. And, and that is why this Wilson's formula or EOQ formula has uh, gained so much popularity because it is so-called insensitive. Uh, some of these parameters is quite difficult to estimate in the real world. Well, the demand might be easy. You know for historical reasons how much the demand will be. Uh, it's not always easy to, uh, to estimate the demand either, but uh, uh, we can often have a quite a good idea of the demand for the coming periods. The C value, the purchase cost, unit value, might also be easy to know how much do you pay to the vendor for, for this item. But the interest rate is not very straightforward to, to calculate. How much is the alternative investment costs? How much, well, breakage, uh, obsolescence, uh, insurance, some of these might be easy to, to find. But still, the alternative, in, uh, alternative investment co cost might be quite difficult to, uh, to estimate. So even if we are often in the problems given a value for this I parameter, for the internal interest rate, in the real life, it's not so easy to, to estimate this exact value. And the same can be seen for the K, the ordering cost. To find the exact value of the ordering cost, ordering cost might be uh, administrative work for the people in the uh, well, sales uh, or purchase uh, office. Uh, it might include some part of the transportation. It might include well, different parts. These two parameters in particular might be quite difficult to estimate, the inter internal interest rate and the ordering cost. But even if you are not able to find the exact correct values on the parameters, this formula or this sensitivity of the EOQ formula uh, will show that uh, even if you are not able to identify the exact optimal policy because of inaccuracy in uh, some of the, the parameters, you might still find a good policy uh, if you are able to find an approximation which is not too far away from the optimal Q. And we can see that on this curve because you see here this is the minimum point, but this point it's not very much higher. This point is not very much higher. So even in this example where the optimal seems to be eight and a half or something, uh, even if you are using maybe 13, you will not have a very much higher total cost. And here, if you are using six, the cost will not increase that much from the optimal policy. Uh, so here we know that if we are able to identify an uh, or find an approximation of this optimal Q, which we don't know if it is the exact optimal, uh, we still can use the policy and get a, a very good uh, policy according to uh, co when comparing the, the cost. Uh, and this formula, which is shown here, that the G of Q, which is the actual cost function with the current policy, divided by the optimal G, which is the optimal cost, if you were able to identify the exact value on all the parameters, can be found, the deviation from the current and the optimal policy can be found by using this formula. One half multiplied by the optimal Q divided by the actual Q, plus the actual Q divided by the optimal Q. For example, if the optimal Q were 500 and the actual Q were 550, uh, then the G of Q divided by the optimal G 
would be one half multiplied by 550 divided by 500 plus 500 divided by 550 and this value will be 1.0045 which is 0.45% from the optimal policy. So if the optimal were an order size of 500, the current policy were 550 or even the opposite which will give the exact same uh, result, then you will not have more deviation on the cost function than 0.45%, which is not very much. Of course, we have to scale up this, and this might be well, very costly um, products, might cost 10,000 kroner or dollars each, for example, then of course this will also be money, but still looking at the percentage deviation, this will not be very much comparing to the optimal policy. <coughs> so a moderate deviation from the optimal queue will not lead to a very high increase in the costs. So even if we don't know the exact values of all the variables, an approximation will usually lead to a good result if the approx approximation is uh, well relatively uh, short from, from the actual optimal value. But um, you can also see by this uh, curve that this is not symmetric. So <coughs> a deviation in this direction will not give the same result as the, devi the same deviation in this direction. Usually, you, should, you, can, you can see here, and this is the more general curve, so usually you should, uh, if you are uncertain about the exact values, you should usually use a higher value because the curve does not uh, increase very much in this direction. It will be, uh, the increase of the, of the cost will be higher if you are having, if you have a smaller queue than if you have a larger queue. Uh, so let's now also talk about the lead time because the inclusion of lead time uh, doesn't really uh, make very much difference, but we need to uh, to consider the time needed for getting a delivery. Uh, when you have a situation with no lead time, we can assume that we have the Q value here, we have a fixed demand, and when we reach zero inventory, we should have a new delivery. Just push a button, get immediately a new delivery of Q item. And so this will continue until some of the parameters or some of the uh, conditions will, will change. But when you have a lead time, you also need to consider that. And here we assume that the L lead time is this period. And then we need to find out how much is the demand in the lead time. How much the d demand will you have from this point to this point? And then this, uh, yeah, this book uses the R. I think I used S in the previous figure for the same, but here you use the R as the reorder point. Uh, so the reorder point here is how much should be on stock when you place a new order. And it, this will, in this fixed demand situation, will be equal to the demand in the lead time. How much demand do you have in the time between you place an order and, or, and until the uh, delivery is uh, received here? And this can be found by multiplying the demand rate by the exact uh, lead time. Here they also use the letter tau as the lead time instead of L. So as mentioned, I'm teaching mo much of the, the, the same and the more advanced inventory theory in a master, master course, and then we have different denotations. And as mentioned, the different books have different denotations. So here, in this book, we use 
the tau as the lead time, and the r as the reorder point. And finding the reorder point, we can multiply the lead time, the tau, to the demand rate. Like this. Reorder point will be the lead time multiplied by the demand rate. And then, of course, we need to have the same time units. So if the demand is per year, then we also need to use the lead time as a fraction of a year. Um, so if the lead time is four months in our example here, let's assume that we, well, that's quite a long lead time for ordering pencils, but that is the uh, values given in, in, the, in the textbook example. And then if the lead time is uh, four months, we know that four months is one third of a year. Then we can use one third and multiply by the annual demand of 3120. And we will get 1040 as the reorder point. When the stock reaches a level of 1040, you should place a new order. And when the inventory level is zero, this order is received. Of course, if the, you know that the lead time is, is uh, fixed and it's uh, a given value. But often, as I uh, mentioned earlier in this uh, uh, lecture, the lead time might be variable. You don't know exactly how long you have to wait. And then we need to, in, in such cases, we need to adjust according to, uh, to so-called stochasticity and we need to adjust these models when you have uh, uncertain values on some of the parameters. <coughs> so we can also talk about what will happen is if the lead time exceeds a cycle. That can also happen. Uh, in the example here, we had uh, well, we had one cycle, which is uh, 1.24 out of a year, which is quite much, and had a lead time of one third of a year, four months. But uh, sometimes we can have a situation where the lead time is actually larger than the cycle time. Uh, so we can just look at uh, one short example, and we can assume that we have an optimal order size found by the EOQ formula, which might be 25. We have an uh, annual demand of 500. And we might have a lead time of six months. No, six weeks, sorry. <clears throat> then we can find the cycle time, which is 25, the order size, divided by 500, the annual demand, uh, which is uh, 25 divided by 500, which is 0 0.05 years. Or we can also calculate this to weeks multiplied by 52. So this is 2.6 weeks. So here we have a cycle time of 2.6. And we have a lead time of 6 weeks. Which means we have a situation like this. Ordering or receiving inventory. Q is equal to 25, we have a fixed rate, get a new delivery of 25, new delivery of 25, and so on. Uh, and the lead uh, or the cycle time here is 2.6 weeks. 
but the lead time is six weeks. Which means to get a delivery at this particular point, we need to order several cycles in advance. So we can now find the ratio between the lead time and the cycle time. And the lead time tau divided by the cycle time t will now be 6 divided by 2.6, which is 2.31. This means that you should place an order for this delivery, two full cycles, and point. 31 in the cycle before that. And we to find the exact value of the, um, uh, of the stock when you should place a new order, you need to multiply the fractional value here by, uh, by the cycle time, which uh, either is 0 0.05 years or 2.6 weeks. So, the R value given as a fraction of a year is 0 0.05 multiplied by 0 0.31, which is uh, 0 0.0155. Or we can use weeks instead, 2.6 multiplied uh, well, to, to have the, uh, the annual demand, we can. Uh, this will now be the R. Uh, this was nonsense. Just remove it. This will now be 0 0.0155. And to find the exact demand uh, or the exact value of the reorder point, we have to multiply this value by the annual uh, demand. So this one should now be multiplied. Uh, this uh, should be multiplied by the lambda, which is 500. And then the reorder point, the value of the reorder point here will be zero, no, uh, 7.75, which is approximately 8. So in this case, when you have eight items on stock, place a new order, this point, place a new order, and 2.31 cycles later, you will receive that order. So you need to plan in advance to be able to get the delivery at the exact correct point. So this is the way when the uh, lead time is higher than the cycle time, you need to find the reorder point by using the fraction, fractional value of the ratio, ratio shown here. Okay, well let's take a break and then we'll continue on this topic in 15 minutes.